think that is enough time. So we will we will get started. So once again, um, for those of you that are here with us this evening, thank you very much for being here with us. My name is Brett McAllister. I'm the director for graduate admissions for the Hamas College of Arts and Sciences. With me also this evening is one of my assistant directors, Ms. Megan Troy. Um, for those of you that have not met her yet, she runs our enrollment management process for the Department of Chemistry and Physics, which is the main reason we are here tonight for the wonderful medicinal chemistry master's degree that they are being running, which is also why I have the absolute privilege to introduce with us tonight, um, Dr. Richard Deeth, who will be speaking to us this evening. So just a quick bio um, about Dr. Deeth. Um, he is a professor of pharmacology in the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences at Nova Southeastern University and professor emeritus at Northeastern University. He received his undergraduate degree with a Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy from State University of New York at Buffalo and his doctoral degree in pharmacology from the University of Miami. His research interests are focused in the role of oxidative stress and impaired methylation reactions in neurodevelopmental, neuropsychiatric, and neurodegenerative disorders, including the important role of epigenetic regulation. His laboratory was the first to identify the unique ability of D4 dopamine receptor to carry out phospholipid methylation and showed that numerous environmentally derived toxins, including heavy metals, potentially impair this process as well as other meth methylation reactions. Dr. Deeth has published more than 100 peer-reviewed research articles and book chapters in 2003. He authored the monograph, Molecular Origins of Human Attention, the Dopamine Folate Connection. In recent years, his work has focused on understanding the factors contributing to autism epidemic. This ongoing work includes investigations of the status of antioxidant, glutathione, and B12, the influence of morphine and glutacassine-derived opioid peptides on redox and methylation status, and the role of inflammation in brain disorders across the lifespan. Now, I hope I did that ju justice, doctor. I know that was new for me, a couple of those words in there. Um, well, so <clears throat> if you didn't put them to sleep with those words, it's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, Dr. Deeth, um, for those who are watching, we will have a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session at the end. So feel free to end your questions as they come up, and then we will moderate them and get them answered as best we can at the end of the lecture series. And with that, Dr. Deeth, thank you so much once again for being here. We are very excited to listen in. Take it away. The show is yours. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Brett and, and, and Megan. Um, and uh, thanks, people, for uh, tuning in on this Monday evening here to some serious biochemistry, and uh, but I hope it's relevant biochemistry because what we do, uh, I think, is, is important for understanding some society-wide uh, issues here, like what's causing the increase in autism, for example, uh, what's going on with COVID, long-haul COVID, and things like that. We'll touch on those as we go along here. But it's also really meant to illustrate uh, what you can do by applying an understanding of chemistry, medicinal chemistry, uh, and combining that with some knowledge of, of molecular structure, um, and uh, make, in my case, a career out of it. So uh, let me get, let me get started, if I could, here, uh, bringing up uh, the presentation here. Um, so as the title promises, we're going to talk about oxidative stress, that is not having enough antioxidant uh, compared to what you need. And we're going to particularly relate that to the process of inflammation, cytokine production, and uh, things like that. And then we'll end up in the end uh, talking a little bit more about something we discovered uh, more recently with a derivative of vitamin B12 called cobinamide. And uh, we learned about this because of the way it's been used in autism. Uh, and we'll be referring back to autism, uh, which is a primary interest of our lab. Um, so uh, let's start off, uh, if I could, by saying what is the uh, NL NLRP3 inflammasome? Well, what's an inflammasome to start with? Well, inflammasome is something that gets inflammation started. Um, and it, this particular inflammasome, the NLRP3, turns out to be, I'll say, probably the most important one, certainly the most important one in COVID and brain disorders and things like that. And uh, what's illustrated here uh, is how the inflammasome gets started and really how it works, if you will. Um, 
inflammation, if you, uh, or if we're thinking here about uh, COVID again, uh, gets started when some foreign uh, agent, maybe a bacteria or a virus, comes along. We'll call that a PAMP, a pathogen associated molecular pattern, some of the proteins in the coronavirus. Uh, when cells are exposed to those kind of things, uh, they start to turn on certain genes, which otherwise were quiet and not turned on. And when they turn on those genes, these are the building blocks of an inflammasome. An inflammasome, it's a structure. It's like star-shaped structure over here. You can see it's made up of some multiple different proteins. And those proteins are turned on when something triggers inflammation here. And uh, once they're turned on, they self-assemble. That's what's really interesting and important. There's all these proteins stick to each other. They form an assembly and they, uh, they bind to each other so strongly that you really end up with just one large structure per cell. Uh, even though they're produced individually, they all stick together and form a, a big complex. And uh, that complex eventually uh, gets activated. And the, so the first step of put, uh, making these uh, proteins or turning the genes on, it's called priming. And uh, you get exposed to something that primes the system. And you got now all the proteins you need to make an inflammasome. But they're not necessarily all active yet. And the system can be turned on and, and turned up, if you will, by step two, which is a process called activation. And really, it's a little more of that that we're focused on here, because one of the primary things that activates the inflammation or inflammasome process is oxidative stress. Now, we've got a lot of stresses in life, but at the cellular level, the, ox the meaning of oxidative stress is that your uh, level of producing uh, oxidizing molecules like hydrogen peroxide, or superoxide anion, from really from mitochondrial activity, um, is higher than your ability to neutralize those byproducts of energy production. So oxidative stress goes along with energy production, and it means mostly you don't have enough antioxidants to uh, take care of all those byproducts there. So oxidative stress turns on the inflammasome, and the activity that gets turned on is the production of cytokines. You've heard of the cytokine storm for COVID, and this is where they come from. Uh, they come from the NLRP3 inflammasome, and the one that you're going to see recurring here mostly is one called IL-1 beta, interleukin-1 beta. And what the inflammasome does, it releases that IL-1 beta from a precursor or pro form here. And once the IL-1 beta is produced, it's released outside of the cells that produced it. And it goes ahead to circulate and to activate inflammation in other cells and so forth. So it gets inflammation started and ultimately can lead to other cytokines being produced here. There are other signals that turn on the inflammasome besides oxidative stress, but really this is the important fundamental one that we're gonna focus on. Uh, and one of the other ones that's shown here, and we'll get back to that later, is the you can turn on the inflammasome by activating a channel, this, uh, a potassium channel down here called the P2X7 receptor is also uh, a way to activate the inflammasome because anything that causes potassium to leak out of the cell is going to promote inflammation here. So uh, this uh, some pictures, some illustrations of what the inflammasome looks like as it starts to assemble here. It's made out of different pieces or proteins that come together to form the, the final complex. We're gonna be focusing on mainly this part right here. This is a molecular image of the structure of the NLRP3 shown here in silver. And I've highlighted in pink some of the cysteine or sulfur amino acid residues that are in the protein here. And that's what we're gonna talk about. 
In yellow here is another protein called NEC7, NEK7. It binds to the inflammasome, this part of the, uh, of the activation process as well here. But I told you before that the inflammasome proteins are complex with each other and they build up and they, they form what's called a speck ultimately. You see this pink thing in the left? This is a stained speck in a cell here. And uh, that in high power is shown in the right side here. But as I said, there's one speck because these things tend to form structures so uh, so strongly that there's typically one speck per cell. Um, and uh, the, uh, the formation of that speck and uh, that inflammasome uh, has been documented in COVID in particular. If you go in and search NLRP3 and COVID, you'll find tons of papers. Um, and when uh, people looked in the lungs of uh, individuals who died from severe COVID, for example, um, in pink here, you can see these specks that are reflecting the inflammasomes that have developed in the lungs of these um, people who again passed away from uh, from COVID and from the activation of the NLRP3 um, in in that setting here. So we're we're talking about something that has contemporary interest, and quite frankly, that's part of the reason that I got interested in this is uh, when uh, back in 2019 and 20, when COVID uh, epidemic began, I started to say, what do I know? Uh, from my research uh, expertise that might have relevance for COVID, might help out and contribute to the story. Um, and uh, what you're going to hear in, in part is the result of uh, me looking into the NLRP3 inflammasome cytokine storm connection here. But I, I was always and still am a, a brain researcher. And so it's um, you would not surprise perhaps that this NLRP3 inflammasome here is also implicated in lots of brain disorders. I put three Alzheimer's paper, papers here, but uh, it's also in Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative diseases, as, as well as in autism that we're going to talk about um, in the, just a couple of minutes here more. But um, for example, in Alzheimer's, if you take out uh, some blood cells, some monocytes, from somebody with uh, Alzheimer's disease, and we could break them down into how severe their uh, to their Alzheimer's is, healthy controls, mild cognitive impairment, mild Alzheimer's or full-blown Alzheimer's disease. Uh, what you can see is up at the top here, this is the NLRP3 level in those uh, monocytes. They've been stimulated with uh, A beta here as well as with something to trigger the uh, inflammasome activity, uh, LPS, as it's uh, normally uh, abbreviated. And you can see that as the Alzheimer's is more severe here, there's a lot more of this NLRP3 protein that's produced in the, the monocytes here in, um, in individuals with, uh, with Alzheimer's disease. Numerically on the left here, you can see, oh, the level is about three in the healthy controls, and it's 1,300 in the full-blown uh, uh, Alzheimer's uh, patients over here. Um, and, and so this is real clear evidence that there's neuroinflammation or inflammation uh, in, in Alzheimer's disease here. So well, that's part of the reason that we study it, uh, along with its involvement in, in autism, like I said. Um, and so, of course, we became interested. I'm a molecular guy. I like to know at the most detailed molecular level, how do things work and what, how does nature work, if you will. And so here we can ask the question, how does oxidative stress promote that activity of that NLRP3? And um, um, the way that we've investigated, and it's uh, one that I think other investigators uh, have taken as well here, is to focus on the sulfur molecular activities, and in particular, the sulfur amino acid cysteine, which is shown on the left here. Here's the SH group or thiol group. 
of cysteine. And you may know that when oxidation it prevails, let's say during oxidative stress, these cysteines or thiols, the, the sulfurs can bind to each other and they form an oxidized disulfide bond here. Um, and this would actually, if this is cysteine, this would be cysteine, which is basically two cysteines bound together by a disulfide bond. So it's this equilibrium back and forth between oxidized and reduced forms that determines whether somebody's in oxidative stress or not. And oxidative stress is when you have an extra amount of these uh, these disulfide linkages here. Well, I took a look at the detailed amino acid sequence of that NLRP3 protein. In particular, the part of it that's called the leucine repeat region or LRR here, what you're looking at here, it's a lot to take in. I, I, I grant you that, but that is three sequences of the NLRP3 from the bat, the human, and the mouse. Now, humans are in the middle here, um, but we didn't look into the bat because of the Wuhan connection here. Um, and mouse, of course, uh, a, a laboratory uh, model that's commonly used here. But um, what I hope you can appreciate, what we found, and nobody else had noticed this ourselves, that there was a, a repetitive pattern of the cysteine, the sulfur amino acids in the LRR, the leucine, which repeat of the NLRP3. And you can see that here because they're equally uh, lined up or separated from each other by these connecting lines here, each one of which uh, shows that uh, there's about 56 amino acids or something like that uh, between each of the repetitive cysteines here shown in purple. And that's uh, equal to the length of, of one of the repeats that are in this segment. So what that says is each of the of the repeats, although they are different in their amino acid sequence, they do have these conserved cysteine residues that form a regular pattern here. And in green here, you see uh, double cysteines, one cysteine right after the other, call those vicinal cysteines. They allow for two SSs to be right next to each other so they can easily form internal uh, uh, disulfide bonds uh, if they're oxidized versus reduced here. And it's unusual to find as many as we did here. You can see there's uh, three of them which are really well preserved here and in yellow the other are, are also the double ones here. So there's a total of six in uh, this uh, sequence uh, for, for humans here which is really quite a bit uh, unusual to have that many. And uh, also pointing out in the bottom here if you compare the human sequence and the bat sequence, the bat is the one on top. And I hope you can see it, it. It's longer than the human one. The human one stops over here. So does the mouse. But the bat is longer and it's got some extra cysteines in it that can give rise to some different properties here. And uh, one of the things that's of interest to us was the fact that when you have two cysteines next to each other and here like two of these pink uh, cysteines right next to each other, the vicinal cysteine pairs, they form a binding site that can be um, bound to by vitamin B12 or cobalamin, which is one of our laboratory's interests as well. And that raises the possibility that if the cobalamin bound to some of these uh, repeated sequences here, that it might regulate the uh, inflammation. So keep that thought in mind. And when we look at the molecular structure of the inflammasome, the NLRP3 repeat, those regular cysteines that I pointed out before, they form like a band at the top. Here's number two, number three, band four, and then band one down here. These correspond to these lines that I showed you up in this uh, other figure. 
And then that means that the, the surface of this inflammasome has got these regularly spaced cysteines that could form disulfide bonds with anything else that happened to be nearby, close enough to form a, a disulfide bond. So we thought that was kind of interesting, and it is interesting as a potential way of regulating here. We don't know exactly whether those disulfide bonds form in one area or another and how they might play a role. That's future work, things that people with techniques that I don't really have, I have to say, um, uh, that, that could explore, and hopefully they will explore in the future. But they could contribute to the formation of these tight complexes that are typical of an inflammasome. Now, the, the controversial Wuhan connection in China is because the uh, immunology, uh, the, the virology lab rather in Wuhan um, published this paper just about a few months before uh, the start of the COVID uh, uh, epidemic. And it was uh, work over there by uh, groups that has published a lot of work um, Dr. Uh, Zheng Li Shi in particular here. Um, and what they did is they looked at the repeat region that I was just talking about in the upper right here, the human uh, NLRP3 and its repeats are in white and the bat is in red. And it, it turns out that the bats um, are much more sensitive to activation of the inflammas, should be much less sensitive. Bats are less sensitive than humans are to activation of the inflammasome. And that makes the bats uh, potentially a reservoir. You could, we could wonder why doesn't COVID kill bats? Well, the answer is here, because there's something about the NLRP3 inflammasome of the bat that's different. And uh, if you can, you can see on the right, they they, they took the sequence of the bat, the red one, and they attached it to the rest of the molecule from the human. And they found that when they did that, they made the human uh, NLRP3 less easy to activate as well. So this really kind of curiously interesting thing suggested that the difference in species sensitivity to COVID and to uh, activation of the inflammation process uh, might um, might be uh, involving the cysteines that are a part of the inflammasome. And in general, uh, I hope I can summarize that here, that the, the inflammasome, when its cysteines are oxidized and forming disulfide bonds, either internally or with a second inflammasome molecule or something like that. But when inflammasomes disulfide bonds are forming because of oxidative conditions, it's active and it's, it's making cytokines. And in fact, people with COVID that had um, low levels of, uh, of antioxidant, they were more likely to die from serious COVID than those without uh, that. And those that have normal levels of antioxidant were less seriously affected than those who had uh, low levels of antioxidant. Uh, and so just in broad terms here, just for the sake of talking about it, uh, we can see that activity of the inflammasome is associated with oxidation. Whereas if you have reduced disulfides here with the SH instead of the SS, uh, or if you cover up the SH with another SH, and that's called uh, sulfhydration or persulfidation, you can keep the inflammasome in an inactive state. So we're learning some details here about how oxidative stress controls the inflammasome activity, and hopefully we can apply those things therapeutically um, uh, in, in the future. I also, I did mention early on that the trigger, another trigger besides oxidative stress is this channel, this ATP activated P2X7 receptor over here. And uh, we looked at the structure of that as well. There's the X-ray published X-ray crystal structure of it. It's a channel, it's got an outside of the cell portion, a, a transmembrane part, and then, excuse me, an inside part here. And you can see the hole right down the middle here. This is the channel 
the, the potassium moves through, for instance, here. And um, the uh, we looked at the amino acid sequence there, and we're also kind of struck by the fact that not only does it have lots of cysteines here shown in green, but it's got a number of those double cysteines, those vicinal cysteines as well, uh, suggesting, again, that oxidative stress can regulate this P2X channel um, as well. So um, these things were uh, sort of background interest for us at our lab that is trying to understand oxidative regulation of inflammation. But uh, we also had another line of work, which I'm going to sort of switch gears to, although they, they do come together a little later on. Um, and, and that has to do with vitamin B12 uh, or cobalamin, as it's known. And vitamin B12 is a cofactor for a couple of enzymes in the body here. Um, and uh, it has an, an interesting structure, a complicated structure, but it has a cobalt in the middle here. Uh, this is a cobalt that I'm pointing to that makes it cobalamine. There's a ring here, corin ring, that the cobalt is in. And it has a tail. And the tail part can actually come all the way back to bind to the cobalt forms like sort of a ring structure when it does that, or the tail can be extended and off in space like this. I mean, on, off, um, back and forth of that changes the uh, reactivity of the cobalt here. Um, and this is a part of how it works in the enzyme as a cofactor to facilitate the transfer of a methyl group, you know, for instance, that way. And, um, let me, well, I'll leave it as that, but I'm going to talk about cobinamide here. This is on the right, and you'll see why in a second. Cobinamide is cobalamin or B12 without the tail. And if the tail is cut off or not put on in the first place, you end up with cobinamide. So how did we come across this? Well, uh, this diagram here, which we call in the lab our holy diagram, not because we're sacrilegious, but because we appreciate that this embodies a lot of very fundamental things about how cells work and how they're regulated across the lifespan and how it supports life as we know it here. Um, things that have to do with methylation of DNA, epigenetic regulation over here, because the lower right is a cycle of methylation. The lower left is the dopamine receptor phospholipid methylation that Brett introduced when we first got started here. We discovered that back in 1998. And at the top in the middle is that production of the antioxidant glutathione or GSH, which is the main antioxidant inside of all cells in the body whether we're talking about neurons, which are shown here, or we're talking about the liver cells or kidney cells or heart, glutathione is the main antioxidant. And what you can see is there's a connection between the methylation cycle here and the production of the antioxidant through this other pathway called transsulfuration, it's called. And it's work that I'm not talking about here tonight, uh, but could. Uh, has to do with the uh, modulation of uh, this process or the amount of glutathione by peptides from casein or from gluten, because uh, along the way we discovered the fact that when you drink or milk uh, that makes the, uh, the digestion of milk can lead to peptides, opioid peptides being formed, and the same is true for case for gluten from uh, wheat products. And in the GI tract, those things regulate the uh, uptake absorption of cysteine by their effects. But we're not going to talk about that <laughs> too much. Well, but we talk mainly about neurons here. If this was the brain, we'd recognize that astrocyte cells are next to neurons and they have an intertwined or connected um, metabolic uh, pathways with them. But we study autism. We study this enzyme down here, methionine synthase, it's called, 
which has vitamin B12 or cobalamin, methylcobalamin abbreviated here, as a cofactor for that enzyme. And uh, this enzyme, and this B12, very sensitive to oxidative stress, turns it off. Um, and uh, this is an important way to regulate methylation processes, um, as well as this dopamine pathway here. And uh, we were interested in how this plays out in autism. And I hope I don't have to tell you that autism rates are very high these days, and they have been progressively getting higher ever since about 1990. And over the last several decades, they've gone up 100,000 fold, something like that. Um, it's uh, really an epidemic of autism. And if you look and analyze the metabolites that are on this diagram here, let's say the glutathione here, or the homocysteine here, or the methionine here. If you analyze those things, which Dr. Jill James and Arkansas and others, including us, have done, you find that the levels in the blood, in the plasma, are low in kids with autism, and they stay low even if they reach adulthood and, and so forth. So autism is characterized by low levels of, here's the glutathione down here, 36% lower, 20% lower of the sulfur amino acid cysteine that's key for making the glutathione. Um, and uh, so you have a deficit in all these things in autism. And if you have a deficit in those things, and they're the things that regulate the inflammation process, chances are you're going to be more sensitive to developing inflammation uh, if you have autism. And who knows what came first? Uh, I could propose, more or less that's what I think, is that the uh, inflammation process was triggered to uh, in kids with autism, and that contributed to their autism symptoms. And here's some um, results similar to what I showed you for Alzheimer's earlier, showing that if you take some blood cells, monocytes, from kids with autism, that's uh, shown here, or healthy siblings, brothers or sisters without autism, or healthy controls, you can see that, again, the level of the NLRP3 uh, gene being turned on is a lot higher, six-fold higher here. Um, and the level of the IL-1 beta, for example, it's three or four times higher in kids uh, with autism compared to controls. So this means that the NLRP3 is turned on in autism um, and uh, certainly uh, able to contribute to it here. Another thing that's interesting, and I like to put pieces together here, uh, a drug called Suramin that was uh, used for African sleeping sickness and so uh, was sort of an esoteric uh, uh, disorder, certainly in the United States, but more common in, in Africa. Uh, but this drug has been found in early clinical trials to treat kids with autism, at least some, with rather dramatic improvements, uh, starting to speak, uh, whereas they weren't speaking before in some cases. And suramin is an inhibitor of this P2X7 channel here. So again, you know, this adds to the possibility that the autism uh, inflammation connection uh, is important, uh, and that maybe we can, if we can inhibit this process, we can treat autism. So, um, but otherwise, treating autism uh, has been, you know, it's, it's certainly not um, uh, a, uh, a, um, a slam dunk. <laughs> that is to say, there are treatments, but they don't work for everybody, and, and they never can really turn back the clock for what's already occurred during early development. But some important improvements, including speech uh, improvements and, and attention awareness and so forth, have been able to be uh, demonstrated with treating kids with injections of 
methyl B12, methyl cobalamin, which is shown here as the cofactor for this enzyme methionine synthase. Um, we had studied that enzyme in the brain, postmortem brain samples of uh, normal people. That enzyme is on the shows on the left here the mess the messenger RNA levels of that in the human brain with age go down about 400 fold or something like that. They go down a lot. And this is in normal individuals as they age. The, the decrease is very steep up until the age of 10 or so, 10, 12. But if we look at autism brain samples, which we did in red here on the right, it's um, lower, uh, especially at the early ages. It's a, a lot lower than it should be over here. Um, and so we were suspicious that there was something about this enzyme uh, that was connected to autism. And then we measured the brain levels of methyl B12, methylcobalamin, and found that they were really markedly lower in kids here with autism. Average age was nine years old. Uh, and uh, the level of decrease here was that that we might have expected in a, in a 50 year old or something like that. So in any case, methyl B12 was is low in autism and autism brain. And a, a doctor, James Newbrander, Jim Newbrander, somebody whom I'm a friend of, I'd have to say, um, was practicing in New Jersey, Edison, New Jersey. And he started to use IV, excuse me, I sub Q, excuse me, subcutaneous injections of really high concentrations of methyl. B12 or methylcobalamin. Um, and he had some amazing responders. He had some kids that started to talk and did well and so forth. And he presented these at a number of meetings and some uh, small papers were published about it. But he saw improvements in speech, socialization, sensory cognition, and so forth by giving these methyl B12 injections. It looked like um, this was really an important uh, breakthrough finding. But other doctors started to use this same subcutaneous methyl B12, and they didn't find as robust an effect. They found some improvements, but not as good as Dr. Newbrander found with his patients. Well, that's a disappointing thing, but maybe there's more to that story. So what we appreciated was that Dr. Newbrander um, used... Um, only the methyl B12 from a particular pharmacy, compounding pharmacy in Hopewell, New Jersey, Hopewell Pharmacy and Compounding Center. Um, and um, so we decided that uh, we hypothesized that maybe the fact that he only used that pharmacy and the other uh, clinicians didn't use uh, only Hopewell Pharmacy, maybe that was why his patients seemed to do better. And so um, what we did here, whoops, I want to go back in this direction. We undertook a uh, in the lab a comparison of the methyl B12 compounding products from a half a dozen different pharmacies. So without them knowing it, we um, compared uh, the level of methyl B12 that's shown in this higher bar on the right here in those preparations. And there was some differences. The, the last one here was, was lower. That was sort of a do-it-yourself kind of uh, preparation here. Um, and all of them had some of the methyl B12 that they started with was converted to hydroxy B12. That's the lower column here. But that was about the same in all of them. It really couldn't account for any difference in the preparations. But when we ran them through HPLC systems here to compare them, what we noticed was the Hopewell Pharmacy product had some extra peaks here, right around the big methyl B12 peak, uh, that indicated that there was something different about their product than the others. Oh, interesting. Let's investigate that. And when we looked at the Hopewell protocol there for getting the methyl B12 in the solution. Uh, the, the solutions were so concentrated that what they uh, decided to do was to use 
a pH that was more acidic, 2.1 to 2.2, in order to encourage or facilitate the dissolving of the methyl B12. And other pharmacies that we contacted did not use that acidic pH. Uh, and, oh, well, maybe that's why you got these extra peaks here, if you will. And uh, because what goes on when you have a pH of two, that acid environment can cleave this bond right here and cut the tail off of cobalamin, which yields cobinamide. Oh, so this is where the cobinamide comes from. At least here it could come from that, but we weren't sure of it. We had to, we had to sort of look for that. Um, and uh, we did this in collaboration with Dr. Reza Gaffard, who I, I believe is in the group tonight because we're collaborators uh, here. He's in the chemistry department, of course. I'm in pharmacy, but we have a lot in common when we get down to, to molecular interests and talking about vitamin B12. And, and Dr. Reza was really kind enough to collaborate with us and use his analytical skills to analyze uh, uh, the product, for example, this case from the Hopewell Pharmacy, and was able to find some, although not a lot, uh, but find some of that cobinamide was being produced here. He could separate it out of HPLC, look at a particular peak over here, and find that that peak had the correct molecular size, if you will, or, or um, the atomic size over here, uh, 1,005 Dalton, which corresponds to the uh, methylcobinamide peak that you would get if you if you got rid of the tail over here. So we could detect that. And we also went ahead, um, uh, this was work done uh, with Matt Schreier, former PhD student here, to show that uh, we could start out with methylcobinamide and we used the very strong acid, trific acid here, incubated uh, with that overnight. We could uh, convert most of it to the methylcobinamide. And even now we're continuing further with some studies uh, looking at the effect of pH um, on the conversion of methylcobalamin to methylcobinamide. But we could show here that we got that same 106 uh, um, molecular weight of the methylcobinamide from that triflic acid uh, sort of synthetic treatment, if you will. So uh, this was uh, making the cobinamide and the methylcobinamide in particular, but the methyl group can in water solution or in the body can come off and it can be hydroxocobinamide. That's, um, that's what, what goes on. Um, we looked at the literature about cobinamides and we uh, found uh, some work with Dr. Jerry Boss here uh, at the University of California, San Diego. Um, and uh, some people that he collaborated with injected mice with this hydroxycobinamide or cobinamide, as I'll just lump it together. And what they found was that the level in the in the brains of mice here that had a, up here in red a level of that IL-1 beta here about 25, those that were treated with the hydroxycobinamide was less than five. It was uh, like uh, a reduction by about 80% here. And this made us think that, oh, well, maybe the cobinamides uh, without the tail uh, that B12 has, maybe they have anti-inflammatory activity against the NLRP3. You see how this ties together now, I hope, uh, that uh, we measured uh, along with a collaborator, but we do this in the lab ourselves now here. But um, this is the first thing we found here that when you uh, uh, treat uh, cells with this cobinamide here uh, at different concentrations, you can inhibit the production of IL-1 beta here. Um, and you can inhibit it by 80, 90% uh, when you use these micromolar concentrations of cobinamide. So uh, we think, and we we repeated this several times ourselves, as well as another collaborator at, at Nova. Uh, so we think that this has something to do with the um, therapeutic effects 
uh, of that uh, well um, methyl B12 uh, compounding product here. And uh, Dr. Boss published this work back in uh, last uh, October showing that the, the cobinamide molecule itself has very active and strong antioxidant activity. It mirrors what's called superoxide dismutase activity. That is to say, it neutralizes superoxide molecules, makes them into hydrogen peroxide, but then also it has catalase activity. It can take the peroxide and make that into water. So in combination, this makes this a really uh, fascinating and a very uh, uh, effective antioxidant that can sort of sop up or neutralize those mitochondrial reactive products that go along with uh, mitochondrial energy production here. So what we think uh, here overall, we think that the cobinamide is that's produced here from methyl B12 losing its tail uh, by acidic pH in the Hopewell product. Uh, we think that cobinamide, no matter how you produce it, um, is, is having an, an anti-inflammatory effect by decreasing the role of oxidative stress in terms of activating inflammation. So in other words, we think that's what's going on here is that it's, it's uh, decreasing the role of oxidized cysteines because it's decreasing oxidation here by its antioxidant properties here. Now, finally, so the last aspect to think about here is where does B12 come from? Um, where does cobinamide come from? It's a natural material. Well, it turns out that we get, in, in humans, we get B12 only from bacteria. Only bacteria can make it. No other uh, organisms, no other species can make it. And there's a big, long pathway that makes co cobalamin and cobinamide. And when it comes to making vitamin B12, the tail is the last thing that's put on. These last three steps over here uh, represent the attachment of the tail to cobinamide, which is at this level right here before the tail is added. And it turns out that bacteria, uh, I'm not sure if this can be moved around. Well, I guess it can. Um, but bacteria can... Uh, exchange cobinamide with each other. One bacteria makes and synthesizes cobinamide. It can release that to the outside and then other bacteria can take it up and they can share the cobinamide production that way. Uh, not the B12, but the cobinamide is the thing that sort of holds together these bacterial communities. So we think, I think, that uh, it's an antioxidant activity here of the cobinamide was actually more fundamental and occurred earlier in evolution than its cofactor, which it needs the tail in order to be a, an effective cofactor for its vitamin role here. So that's something to think about or otherwise ponder um, going forward. But just to wrap up, uh, I hope I showed you in more detail than you wanted to know. Uh, that uh, it looks like cysteine amino acids and residues in these proteins here allow for regulation of inflammation by oxidative stress. Oxidative stress turns on inflammation. And if you have oxidative stress, like in autism, chances are it increases the potential for inflammation and or neuroinflammation in autism. And these cobinamides that we've started to study and investigate have anti-inflammatory effects that go along with their antioxidant activities. And those might be the basis for benefit uh, in treating autism. And we hope to move forward with uh, developing uh, that and testing that hypothesis. And then finally, as I said there, I think this points to the possibility that the properties of cobinamide preceded and were valuable during evolution even before the tail on vitamin B12 cofactor role came about.
you know, just to wrap up here, the uh, thanks are due to lots of people, graduate students that have uh, moved on from the lab, graduate students and people who are in the lab still here. Um, Dr. Reza Gafard, I mentioned before, who hopefully will still maintain our collaboration with uh, in the medicinal chemistry program in particular, but also collaborators in Japan uh, and at NSU who helped us characterize this anti-inflammatory effects that I told you about. So um, I hope uh, you can appreciate that this work is worth doing and interesting, keeps me interested in doing it, uh, and it has some relevance to things that we care about, including COVID, um, as well as uh, autism here. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Did I really go for that long? You did, Dr. Deeth, and it was absolutely fascinating to listen to. Um, so I, you know, thank you very much once again for being here. And those of you that are watching, thank you for, for listening as well. We do have a couple of questions for you, Doctor. Um, so I'll just, you know, kind of moderate and read them off to you. Um, you know, answer the best you can, and I'll answer some of the other admissions side stuff as we get to it. Um, but the first question, um, you know, uh, it was more of a question that I, you know, I'll be able to answer for for the students as well. Um, you know, is for those of you out there that are listening, is what is the best way to incorporate medicinal chemistry into my undergraduate curriculum at NSU? Classes, mm -hmm. curricular, extra activities. Um, also, you, know, you are part of the uh, dual admissions process. Um, can you do medicinal chemistry programs as well? So as far as the, the first part of that question, um, in terms of incorporating in your undergrad, um, you know, courses are listed in the, the pharmaceutical uh, minor. And then as far as extra activities, um, doing research uh, with faculty members, as Dr. Deeds just mentioned, he just thanked a couple of students that were in his lab and done work with him. So that is a great way to do that is we highly recommend reaching out to faculty members, speaking with them, get an idea for what their labs are, what they're working on, express your interest. Um, that is a, a great way to do that. Um, that is, that's with the conjunction with the College of Pharmacy, as well as the, the chemistry department, as Dr. Deeth has mentioned. Um, and if you want more specifics about the actual, the dual enrollment process and the actual enrollment within our own master's degree, um, please do uh, reach out to somebody on my staff, either myself or Miss Megan Troy, and we'll dive into that with you a little bit deeper um, about how that whole process works. Um, now, the next one is directly for you, doctor. Um, what is dicucobinamide and what does it do exactly? So the dicu, I guess dicucobinamide. Cobinamide, I guess, uh, is uh, maybe what that um, refers to. So the uh, again, the cobinamide is uh, uh, B12 without the tail, and the diaqua form uh, means that it's got a uh, a OH group on either side, and water can combine with that OH group to make aqua cobinamide. So uh, this is chemistry here. So uh, the dioxyl form is a form of cobinamide with uh, OH groups on both sides of the Corin ring. And uh, that is a species that we've tested um, along with the methyl cobinamide that has the antioxidant, the catalase and the superoxide dismutase activity that I mentioned, which is quite amazing. It acts like an enzyme but it's just a molecule, a single molecule itself, a small molecule, instead of being a protein. And it really has uh, quite remarkable uh, antioxidant properties. Awesome, thank you uh, very much. Um, next question um, for you specifically, and then I'll answer, trying to get you answer these questions for you, Dr. Deeth, as well. Um, you know, is it possible to join um, Dr. D's research team? And I'm kind of guessing how would the student potentially go about that process? Well, uh, I guess if a, a student is a student at NSU, that uh, that certainly can happen. And uh, I have, uh, we've got undergraduate students uh, in the lab now. So I'm thinking Arisha, my uh, Advika have joined the lab in recent times and so forth. So we have three or four, uh, over oh, there's Divyad too. So there's four uh, students uh, in the lab. And, and so it's always possible. Contact me, um, of course, is the uh, point of inquiry about that. 
um, and we can talk about it and see how that might work. Um, or Dr. Reza, if you're thinking along the chemistry, especially the medicinal chemistry lines, then we could actually use help and assistance from people with the interest in the chemistry aspects um, that uh, actually, because I'm in the sort of pharmacy area where we're interested in the, uh, in the cellular effects on that side, but the chemistry aspects that Dr. Reza referred is the, is the contact point for it. And we have a question about, and I guess this one will, I'll take on. Um, can you do the master's in medicinal chemistry if I don't have a medicinal chemistry in my undergrad? The answer is yes. When we're looking at admissions for the medicinal chemistry program, we are looking at your overall academics, but we're also looking at the strengths in your science courses. Of course, having a, a strong background in chemistry. So if you've done Chem 1, Chem 2, um, biochemistry, those are great to lay the foundation for what you will um, have in the master's program. Um, but of course, the higher level science courses is what we're going to look at while we're going over admissions. Um, also, it does include talking with our faculty um, because this is the medicinal chemistry offers an option for research um, through a thesis or internship with the local organization. So it's definitely important that you also are looking at the faculty that we are working with in our medicinal chemistry program to see if there's some interest in possibly the research that you could possibly do. Um, so the background in science is the most important part, but not having medicinal chemistry in your undergrad, that's okay. Thesis, thesis, thesis. That's what really, we want to work in the lab, but doing a, a thesis project of some kind is, is really the, the right idea. Thank you, Megan, for answering that. And thank you, Dr. Deed, for answering those couple of questions. Um, I actually have one for you, doctor. Um, just as far as, you know, you know, you've been at NSU, you know, you've worked with a variety of faculty and stuff like that. You know, what's something you can you can tell our potential interested students out there that really sets you believe sets NSU apart? You've obviously been here, you know, for a, a decent amount of time and you clearly like the university. So what in kind of your opinion really sets NSU on the, the best path for students? Well, uh, I came to NSU. I retired um, emeritus from Northeastern and came down here and I was actually at FAU for a little while up in Jupiter. There neuroscience area up there, but I, I came and took a position at NSU in part because uh, they have a, a very well-developed autism program. They, for me, that was a thing that set it apart for me, and they have researchers who are studying autism in my department, for example, but also in other areas. For example, the the so-called INEM, the Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine, as well as the DO school faculty. And there's a number of people who are interested in integrative medicine and uh, applying that to clinical uh, uh, settings. And so it's not uh, a strict prescription only approach to medicine here at NOVA. Um, and uh, that really is very appealing to me. And I think we're forward thinking, that is to say um, the role of metabolism and biochemistry really important in, in disease and hopefully that's what what uh, my presentation illustrates um, and um, so in any case uh, I think NSU is really well situated and well staffed to uh, to pursue that both in the research setting in the lab but also in the clinical environment as well awesome thank you very much well, you know, Dr. Leith, I can't thank you much for being with us this evening. For those of you watching now and those of you that are watching later on our um, YouTube channel and things of that nature, please keep an eye out for this wonderful lecture. Also, for those of you that have been with us this evening, we do have a virtual open house coming up um, later next month for the medicinal chemistry. You'll get to learn more about the actual ins and outs of the degree itself, speak to any faculty members that will be there as well. Um, so keep an eye out for your inboxes, um, any of our social media accounts we'll be posting things on, and most likely you'll get something in the mail from us because we like to kind of touch all the bases, make sure, you know, you guys are all up to date with the amazing things that our faculty and staff like Dr. Deeth are doing here at the university. So doctor, once again, thank you so much for being here. Um, it's been a pleasure listening to you this evening. I hope you all have a wonderful night and enjoy the start of this great week. Take care, everyone.
Okay, thanks, Brett and Megan.